Thank you so much, Bob, for this nice introduction. <laughs> so, um, actually, I'm not from the Viking land. I'm from another land, but I got imported to Sweden many years ago, as you can judge by my name. Uh, actually, I'm here to learn, first of all, and to share as well. So now it's time to share a little bit about our experience in Sweden. And uh, to start with, uh, I just wanted to uh, summarize what I'm talking, what I'm going to talk about in five points. They will be not very long points, if you are worried about it. Uh, but just to, it's for you to keep in mind that we're going to discuss the history, the observations, the discovery, the relief, and then uh, the perspective for the future. So uh, let's move to the history. Uh, Nick made a nice introduction into the history of POTS. Where does it come from, the, the idea of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome? And uh, he mentioned this study from uh, Mayo uh, Clinic when the idiopathic postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome was uh, described for the first time under this specific term. And uh, if we talk about uh, Swedish experience, this is actually a glimpse in the history, a paper from 1926 about the arterial orthostatic anemia. When you read it in Swedish, I can do it, you cannot do it. <laughs> many, people ref many people speaking English referred <laughs> to this uh, paper. I don't know how they, how they manage this. They can't read Swedish. But this paper describes symptoms and uh, physical findings that are exactly what we, you would expect in POTS patients. Uh, this, is this was not my contribution, of course. I was not there at this time. I was not even born at this time. So now when we uh, dealt with history, let's move to the second point, observations. Um, we started seeing POTS patients around 2009, 2010, when we started our syncope unit. And we didn't know what it was, actually. I've never heard about POTS. I have never been, I had never been looking for patients with POTS. They found me the other way around. And as you can see, you have seen this uh, diagram and this sort of diagram many times today. You can see this impressive increase in heart rate leading to instability of uh, postural hemodynamics and in the end provoking what we call vasovagal reflex syncope. Actually, if you ask me why people, why patients with POTS faint, there are only two possibilities. They, they cannot faint because of POTS, because of postural tachycardia. They may faint because of vasovagal reflex, which is produced or evoked by postural tachycardia, or this is a sort of psychogenic pseudosyncope. So there are only two instances they may faint, not just by postural tachycardia. So uh, now when we were standing there and uh, seeing uh, this uh, very strange behavior of the um, circulatory system, we had an access to uh, tests, biomarker tests, addressing uh, basic cardiovascular uh, neuropeptides. So we started testing them against uh, POTS population. What we found, you can see here, was that uh, patients with POTS have very down-regulated atrial natriuretic peptide, which means they should benefit from uh, excessive fluid intake. It's logical. And the second finding was this impressive increase in norepinephrine which is actually confirmed by many other uh, authors in many other studies. So uh, I would address this point with, uh, about atrial natriuretic peptide and the other point with no, uh, about norepinephrine a little bit later when we will be talking about relief. I want you to keep in mind these two findings. Now, uh, observations, uh, um, 
If we talk about observations, so we looked about we looked at our cohort of uh, younger patients uh, between 18 and 40 years of age uh, in a recent publication. Um, so a colleague of mine, Victor Hammerfors, looked specifically at this group, uh, at the clinical parameters or, and history. And what uh, we found was actually that is there something special with POTS if you look at the, at the standard questionnaire that is uh, usually uh, filled in by all the patients coming to our syncope unit service. It's actually nothing special if you look at it. They report dizziness in the same uh, proportion, traumatic fall in the same proportion, um, prodrome, total number of syncope, duration of symptoms. There's uh, a lot of women, of course, in this group. But you cannot tell if this is POTS. If you just look at the pure questionnaire, if you look at the answers, there is no specific pattern of how they describe the way they feel before they start uh, experiencing the orthostatic intolerance symptom or before they faint. So this was lesson number one. You cannot tell POTS by just taking a standard questionnaire. So you have to perform the study to confirm or exclude the diagnosis with all the shortcomings of the standard head up tilt test that were mentioned by uh, others today. So now, uh, this was about observation, and this was the, the other glimpse that I wanted to share with you. Uh, now, uh, let's uh, talk about the spectrum of symptoms. So, POTS is not very special as far as we talk about uh, syncope-related orthostatic intolerance uh, syndromes. But there's something special with POTS. If you look at the whole spectrum of different, sometimes unusual, sometimes almost psychogenic symptoms, there's something special with uh, POTS. It is not like typical isolated orthostatic hypotension, like isolated vasovagal uh, syncope, or uh, uh, like uh, psychogenic pseudosyncopy. So um, now uh, we started with the history, we moved through the observations, our observations, now we're moving to the discovery. So a few years ago I met uh, Dave Kem on an autonomic, uh, society, autonomic society meeting and I was impressed by his findings, so we decided to collaborate. I had a privilege to collaborate with him. We're still collaborating. He's uh, 82 now, so he's still working very hardly. Uh, so we sent him a few samples of our uh, serum from POTS patients in Sweden with some controls, blinded controls, and patients with recurrent vasovagal syncope. Um, so uh, the answer was, presented in this paper, as you can see in a brief summary, in these three diagrams. Patients with uh, postural orthostatic stachycardia syndrome demonstrated a, a presence in the plasma of autoantibodies or immunoglobulins that were stimulating, in a controlled way, receptors such as alpha-1, beta-1, or sorry, beta-1 and beta-2. So in summary, they differed from regular, usual vasovagal patients. They had something in their blood that may have explained the, sim the symptoms. Now, um, David sent me another uh, paper, another manuscript, in which they tested uh, the same uh, serum samples against uh, angiotensin 1 receptor, and they found a similar, uh, similar disorder. The isolated immunoglobulins from serum samples stimulated angiotensin 1 receptor in almost, uh, as you can see here, in almost 70-75% of all these patients with POTS, not in controls. So we have alpha, beta adrenergic receptors, we have angiotensin receptors, and the question is what it is. So if you look at 
a typical G-protein coupled receptors, all of these mentioned by me, they belong to the same class, actually, G-protein coupled receptors. They are widespread and they were well uh, used by the pharmacological companies. Most of the drugs that we use, that we prescribe, 70% of all the drugs, they act through G-protein coupled receptors, actually, in the body. I didn't know that. I just came to know when we made the discovery. This discovery was later on confirmed by Gerd on a sample of 10 patients with POTS that we sent to him just to confirm David Kemp's discovery. This is not shown here. Gerd showed our results before. And so why do they have so many symptoms, patients with POTS? If you look at this diagram, just look carefully. These small receptors, G-protein coupled receptors, switch on, switch off receptors placed on a cellular membrane, they are almost everywhere. We'll not go into details. I can share this slide if anyone is interested. They are everywhere. So the question now is, could it be an explanation for the whole spectrum of symptoms? We don't know yet. This is a hypothesis, what we're going to test during next, in the next years. So we will have answer one day, not, not now. And uh, we hope that it could be a part of the story, of course. So now, from discovery, we are moving to the relief. It's, it's not enough to tell your patient, oh, maybe you have such special autoantibodies, immunoglobulins circulating in your body, just biting you know, different receptors, so too bad. Now they want to get relief. They want to get better. So we, want, we have to bring relief to these patients. So I'm a cardiologist, so <laughs> what do I start with? Yes, so uh, <laughs> look at this diagram. So this is how the post tachycardia starts by baroreceptor reflex, which is exaggerated in some way. So we start at this point which we know most about. Tachycardia, let's look at it. Let's start dealing with. It was shown a few times today, or many times today, uh, by Nick as well, by everybody here, that we have to deal with tachycardia. So we have a few agents here. These are the agents which we tested. And as uh, it, it, as it was mentioned by my predecessor here, um, he used to look at the heart rate. If it is very high, then he starts treating tachycardia. If you start from 50 to 90, it may, it may be POTS, but there's no use for beta blockers. The, heart, the maximum heart rate is too low. So be careful with uh, using beta blockers or heart rate controlling drugs. Uh, calcium channel blockers are good, in my opinion, in patients with chest pain. So probably there might be something with your coronary vessels out there. Then, if you have problems with uh, blood pressure, with hypotensive tendency, it might be reasonable to treat the hypotensive tendency by vasoactive drugs. And this cocktail is the most used of us. Beta blockers, ivabradine or plus mydodrine, droxidopa. Ox one of the patients reported uh, relief after taking some uh, anti allergic drugs that <laughs> contained pseudo ephedrine. So we started testing it as well. Twerk. Now I'm going to show you something more controversial. This is less controversial. This is cardiology. Now a little bit more controversial in another area. Um, now I show you some off-label used drugs used by patients that just tell me for a phone call, oh, I tested this, you didn't know that, you didn't accept it, but I tested it anyway, and I got so much better. So some patients claim that they got better in uh, the brain fog by using dexamphetamine. Some patients claim that they get better by using tapentadol or buprenorphine against pain, and they have used many other drugs 
without effect before. So this is not randomized study, of course. I want you to understand very well. <laughs> and some patients felt much better using uh, Nick. <laughs> it's, it's not so easy to <laughs> pronounce this. Peridostigmine against uh, gastrointestinal symptoms and muscle fatigue. So in some, in some patients, it works. If you ask me how, I can, I, I can make up some theories, some hypotheses. But the most important is that it works. Isn't it? So if it works, I'm happy. If it doesn't work, too bad. So this is the, mm, the closest to the uh, best solution we can get now. So now it was about the relief. Now we're moving to the fifth point. You remember the fifth point? I was checking if you were alert. <laughs> Anybody? The perspectives. So, these are five points that I think are the most important now. More laboratories with access to the diagnostic tests, more training about POTS, an objective and reproducive method of identifying autoantibodies, if they are the culprit, basic studies, genetic studies, biomarker studies, and then randomized clinical intervention trials with pharmacological interventions and immunotherapy for the sickest ones, for the most severe forms of POTS, of we can, we, uh, that we used to call POTS plus, plus something else. So, uh, to summarize, POTS, probably an old disease in a modern outfit. POTS may mimic other conditions that is difficult to diagnose and treat for an untrained practitioner as it was mentioned many times today, in relation to other conditions, less, more or less defined. And the third one, POTS may have an autoimmune etiology, may have, we don't claim that this is sure, may have an autoimmune etiology, and this G protein coupled receptor autoantibody hypothesis is the closest we can get to the right answer today. So, Thank you for your attention.